Welcome to Rational Science. Today I start the uh, class uh, by dealing with inventions and inventors. And I start the class with a couple of questions. Who invented fire? Well, if you ask the Greeks, they would say it was Prometheus. You know, and uh, he came down from <clears throat> he came down from the Olympus, Mount Olympus, and gave fire to man. Okay, and it was uh, Zeus who punished him by having an eagle eat uh, his liver or his guts uh, for an eternity. Okay, for doing that uh, deed, fire was supposed to belong only to the gods. Uh, but there's something wrong with that uh, fable, that theory. <clears throat> and I guess the uh, Greeks never figured it out because fire had been around already before man. Okay? Um, they should have figured that out because, you know, you have natural fires. Fires that get started by Mother Nature herself, you know, or Zeus throwing his, uh, <clears throat> his bolt and creating a forest fire or a jungle fire or whatever. And uh, so when you trace it, you find out that fire has been around at least uh, 470 million years ago, since 470 million years ago, since the Ordovician. Now, you know, you don't have to believe that date because those dates are very uh, flimsy. But for sure, <laughs> for sure, fire has been around before man. Okay? Because again, uh, many fires start uh, by nature, uh, by lightning hitting maybe some dry leaves or whatever, and you have fire. So man discovered fire. Man did not invent fire. Okay, he ran into like I keep saying. It's like when you discover uh, the wall because you ran into the wall. And so what should they do? What should you claim that? Oh, I invented the wall, or I discovered the wall. Yeah, because you bumped into it, not because uh, you broke your head trying to invent a wall and trying to devise a wall. And the same thing with fire. Fire, um, man bumped against, saw it. And the, the genius part, the, the, the inventive part was sticking a stick in there, pulling it out and using it as a defense against other animals and maybe, you know, harding tools and cooking uh, meat or whatever they used it for in, in the old days. Okay? okay, how about the spear? I mean, spear has been one of the uh, longest standing weapons we've ever had together maybe with fire and the hammer, right? Because, and I'm not sure you could distinguish between a, a hammer and a and a knife, you know, because uh, um, one is sharp and the other one is dull, but they use these stones to hit things, okay? But then at some point they uh, invented the spear, okay? And here's a couple of uh, spears that they found, okay? They look more or less like this. These are the, maybe among the oldest spears out there. And some of these date to about 400,000 years ago. Uh, some say there were spears already 500,000 years ago, okay? And uh, in comparison, you know, the knife, uh, you know, the one that, the, the stone knife <laughs> hitting something with, with a sharp edge, that was there for about two and a half million years ago. So Homo habilis used that, you know, so those are old artifacts. Okay, how about clothes? I mean, here, here we wear clothes, right, today. And who invented clothes? Well, you know, one of the funny ones is that they always uh, paint Neanderthal with clothes, you know. And he looks more or less like this. Ha! Ah, went on the other side. Got a new mouse and I'm not used to it yet. Okay, uh, so, so they always paint them uh, or, or they dress them up in clothes. And the question is, you know, is it because Hollywood actors don't want to go nude on stage when they do Neanderthal uh, parts? I think the Neanderthals were more like the guy on the right, which was the one drawn by Boulet, uh, what is it, 1909? And um, I, I think Neanderthal did not use clothes. And the reason I, I, I think that is that his, antis, his ant, uh, ancestors uh, were around uh, England. Uh, they found two-legged creatures in England 800,000 years ago. Supposedly, whoever those were and whoever was in France and in Germany at the time, two-legged creatures, they gave rise first to man of Heidelberg, and then to Neanderthal, which came like maybe anywhere from 300 to 500,000 years ago. And so we're talking about 800,000 years ago, we're closed around then. And so we had these two-legged creatures in England during the glacier times, right? Because you had these glaciers that were uh, stretched all the way to England. So the England was like Arctic weather at the time. 
And so, yeah, if, if you have Arctic weather and you have no clothes, then that means man or some hominid uh, got used to the cold in uh, Northern Europe. And that's where Neanderthal came, and I'm sure he did not use clothes. There's no indication that there were needles used by um, Neanderthal. We haven't found anything like a needle. And we found no clothes, obviously. Now, people say, well, those things deteriorate over time, and so you shouldn't be able to find them. Uh, I don't think they ever used clothes at all. They had no need for it. They were like uh, wolves today. You know, they sleep in the snow. And uh, so why can't uh, a monkey also sleep in the snow? Is, it, is uh, the cold weather only reserved for uh, mastodons and mammoths and uh, wolves and bears? Can't be a monkey? And so, yeah, I don't think Neanderthal used clothes. And that must have been a distinguishing feature when humans came into uh, Europe, assuming they met. Uh, they would have recognized each other as different species just by the clothes, let alone, you know, their appearance, uh, other appearance. Uh, I don't think they ever met after, you know, even then. Uh, I think uh, Neanderthals disappeared about 40,000 years ago, and humans, the first indication we have of the appearance of humans, in other words, we have a skeleton, right, dates to 35,000 years ago, and that was in Romania, okay? So, um, Pestera Kuo Ace is the cave. And they found a human there 35,000 years ago. And, you know, Neanderthals, for what they see as far as the Musterian technology, he disappeared uh, 40,000 years ago, 5,000 years before humans entered Europe. So I don't think they ever met. And if, if uh, any human really ventured, a clan ventured, ventured into Europe, I'm sure the clansmen would have <laughs> liquidated them. Uh, so that's maybe why we never see any humans in Europe until the Neanderthals are gone. Uh, some people believe they made it. And that's the reigning theory today. Okay. Um, um, how about the, um, the wheel? When did the wheel come into being? Well, for sure, uh, Upper Paleolithic, you have no wheels. You, you don't have the wheel until the Neolithic, uh, less than 10,000 years ago, okay? And uh, so here's uh, who it's uh, ascribed to or uh, attributed to today. It's attributed to um, uh, the uh, Sumerians. And I'm sure it probably preceded the Sumerians themselves, but essentially uh, they uh, figured this out because of the potter's wheel, okay? They had to turn uh, the pot around while they were molding it. And from there, they probably uh, realized that the wheel could be used uh, to put on a cart if they wanted to pull it with, with some horses or donkeys or whatever they domesticated at the time. And I think that's how the wheel came into being. Then they use it, obviously, for chariots and wars and so on. Uh, but the oldest wheel that we've uh, found is Sumerians. And maybe you're talking about I don't know, maybe 3,500 years before Christ or something along those lines, okay? And certainly the Egyptians around the same time had the wheel a little later, but you're talking about, again, maybe 3,000 to 4,500 years ago. Somewhere in between there, they had the wheel on carts, okay? Okay, um, so what is an invention? Let's find out uh, by making a little trip. We're going to go on a, on a trip, um, time travel. <laughs> we're we're going to play an Einstein here. We're, we're going to go and time travel, go through the time tunnel, and we're going to go see some Neanderthals, okay? And we're going to meet this fellow. His name is Org. And Org's going to go to the patent office to patent his new invention, okay? So here's Org, okay? So Org goes to the patent office, okay? And when the uh, worker there says, uh, Hi, Org, uh, what do you come here for? says, I'm going to patent this thing. And what is that? Well, it's uh, a club. Club, huh? Uh, what do you use it for? Why well, you use it to bop other Neanderthals over the head of the neighboring clan. And uh, I also sometimes use it on my wife. And it works wonders. So, okay, I'll grant you patent number three. Okay, looks like a good device that, I, that you could use there. Okay, there you go. Uh, next day, another fellow comes in. And his name is Gore. So Gore goes in there and uh, patent uh, clerk says, okay, what do you got, Gore? I have board. Board? What is board? Well, board is, uh, I use it to hit two Neanderthals over the head, to bop them over the head with. Works wonders. Okay, it sounds like a useful device. Okay, you get patent number four. 
Okay, so we had two patents now, okay, uh, aside from the earlier two. <laughs> um, next day, another guy comes in. His name is Tron, okay. Say, hey, Tron, what do you got there? Well, I've got this device, which I made. I took Gore's idea, and I took also uh, uh, the other fellow, uh, Org, and, um, and I built this thing. I put four of these clubs underneath this board, and this is the device, this is the device I have. So what do you use that for? Uh, well, I use it um, to bop people over the head with, but see, it's much better than handing just a board from your hands. You can grab it by any one of the legs and swing it around and bop people over the head with. Okay, I'll grant you patent number five. Okay, okay. The next day we have another fellow, he's from the new generation, okay? And unlike these guys, he's got a double syllable name, okay? So he's known as Loon Boy. He comes in there and he says, I've invented this. What is that? Sounds like the same uh, device that um, this other fellow came in with yesterday. And he uh, says, well, I call it table. Table? What is table? He says, well, y y you can put your meals on the table and eat from the table. And you can also use a smaller one and you can sit on it and we call it chair. Yeah, but we already have table and chair. We, we, we use them every day. They, they are made of stone. We are stone people. We are in the stone age. We don't use wooden things. Well, to make a long story short, uh, he doesn't grant a patent to Loon Boy. Okay? And the main reason he doesn't patent uh, one of them is that it was not really an invention. It's the, the same thing that the other guy invented, but he just did something different with it. There was no, no, no new device. He just used it for something else. That was one of the issues, and the other one was this, it uh, didn't work. When they put their um, uh, mammoth stake on it, it broke the, ta the table, and they said, well, we can't use this, not for our mammoth stakes. And so, uh, you know, he didn't grant it because of that. But we have an issue here, and the issue is, uh, did uh, Loon Boy have an invention or an innovation? And there's a difference. Okay, and here uh, we look at the definitions we find in the uh, both in the Wikipedia and the dictionary, and here you see them. Okay, what is an invention? Well, uh, or what is it to invent? It says to originate or create as a product of one's own ingenuity, experimentation, or contrivance. Well, um, you know, what are we talking about? Are we just talking about ideas? Because if you're just going to create, you know, and then it says product. And what do we mean by product? Are we talking about a solid thing, like a gadget, a thing? Or are we talking about ideas, They're just, uh, for example, methods, processes? And so this is, this is more or less like we just had uh, Loon Boy. You know, he, uh, he came up with the same thing, but he's using it for something else. That's all he did. Is he going to patent that uh, table and saying, I invented table? Simply because he took the same device and just turned it over and said, I have a different device. Okay, so we have to distinguish between, I guess, an invention and a, uh, an innovation, a new use for that same invention, same gadget. Okay? Uh, Wikipedia has invention, a unique or novel device, method, comp uh, composition, or process. It may be an improvement upon a machine or product or a new process for creating an object or a result, an invention that achieves a completely unique function. Uh, and this is what happens when people don't know how to define words scientifically because there's so much gray in there. So much gray. It's got to be black and white if you're going to use it scientifically. But when you have so much gray, then people have different opinions, end up with different opinions on what an invention is and whether you have an inno innovation over an existing invention or just a, a cosmetic modification or whatever, you know. So we have to distinguish. We've got to find out what an invention really is. Okay. And uh, what is an innovation? It says something new or different introduced. Something new. Uh, a new idea, uh, you know, uh, how to cook maybe. Uh, different uh, cook uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, soup differently. Bake a cake differently. Is that what uh, innovation is? Or is it creating a new thing? Okay. And the Wikipedia says, innovation, the carrying out of new combinations, 
Okay? That include the introduction of new goods, new methods of production, the opening of new markets, the conquest of new sources of supply, and the carrying out of a new organization of any industry. Personally, I don't know what uh, business has to do with innovation, especially in, in regards to the word as it is used in terms of patents or in terms of gadgets. Okay? Now, I worked in the industry, semiconductor industry, for many years as a process engineer. And one of our functions was uh, to write specs. You have to change specs constantly. In fact, I would say that maybe on an average, I uh, had to write a spec, uh, modify a spec, about maybe once a week on the average. You have many specs for different machines. Sometimes you get a new machine in. Sometimes there's a new process. Uh, sometimes you adjust the control limits. There's all kinds of things going on. And maybe on the average, I, I, I would say that I had to change the spec, one spec, of my, my portfolio once a week on the average. I think that was the same for all the engineers. And um, if, if every time I change the spec, you're going to say, oh, you invented something new. That's not an innovation. That's an invention. Man, I, I should be given a bunch of patents for, <laughs> for inventions. Okay. And one thing you should be aware of, and, and I'm an expert in it, <laughs> believe me, uh, you know, I had to copy uh, these specs to distribute them. Why? Because uh, the companies I work for, Intel and AMD, Advanced Micro Devices, the semiconductor chip companies, right? Uh, they, um, they do not patent their processes, their methods. And, you know, they're not the only company. I mean, you have companies like Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. Uh, fa my father worked for Coca-Cola. <laughs> and Coca-Cola never, uh, patent never patented its, its uh, process for uh, making Coca-Cola. And they've had it since the 1800s, uh, 1890, 1880s, I think it was. They uh, invented Coca-Cola. Right? And the reason Coca-Cola doesn't patent it is a totally different reason than uh, these chip companies. Chip companies don't patent because they don't want the competition or especially other countries from copying their processes. Coca-Cola is not interested so much in that. What they're interested in is something else. It's a selling point. They say, look. Anybody out there who says they manufacture Coca-Cola, that they uh, also produce Coca-Cola, they're wrong because they don't know how we manufacture, how we, how we produce Coca-Cola. They don't know the process. They don't know the method. Why? Because we've never patented it. And by not patenting it, you know, you don't have protection, but they don't want protection. Their protection is their word that they have a unique product because nobody can copy it because nobody knows how they make it. That's their, that's their slogan. That's their theory, that's their way of, of uh, thinking. And so a lot of companies don't uh, patent their process, uh, processes. And some of their com companies, again, I cannot imagine them patenting, patenting their processes because, like I said, I changed the spec, uh, one spec at least once a week on an average, and I wasn't the only engineer. There were other engineers also changing their processes like on a regular basis. And what are you going to do? Patent every time someone makes a change in the spec? So, so this is where the problem is. They can't keep, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing process to change specs and to change the process. And you're not going to patent every time you, you change the process because it changes almost every day from one region of the area, uh, fabrication area to another. So, uh, so yeah, uh, the question is whether processes, uh, methods, have anything to do with patents. Now, the patent office does accept uh, patents for processes. Okay, they do accept that. The question is whether that makes any sense. And yeah, I mean, there's no other place to take your process. Maybe to the copyright office. Instead of patenting, you copyright. I don't know. Uh, the issue here is whether an invention has to do with a process or whether it just has to do with a new gadget, a new device. Okay, and I think that's where we should limit uh, inventions and, in, and inventing. Okay, but that's my take on that, okay? Again, that's uh, for the politicians to figure out <laughs> what uh, version of uh, patenting uh, they wish to uh, pursue. Okay, um, I'm raising this because uh, there were some uh, people left behind in the uh, noble world, okay? And I'm gonna tie some loose ends today on those people, okay? And the question, again, whether they invented something or whether they um, uh, made innovations uh, cosmetic maybe changes to an existing product okay okay and so the first issue here is uh, whether uh, I raised this issue a couple weeks ago whether ideas are unlimited 
And I'm sure a lot of people will argue, or most people will argue, that ideas are unlimited. And I think that's because they never thought about that in any way. But uh, we can spend all day arguing on whether ideas are unlimited. The question is whether inventions, which is a subset of ideas, whether those are unlimited. And so uh, the question is whether if you pull the last marble out of the bag, you know, there, there's, uh, there's any more uh, uh, marbles in there. Is the bag a uh, bottomless pit where you can just draw inventions forever, or are inventions limited <clears throat> uh, to a point where once you pull that last marble, there's no more marbles in there? That's going to be the issue here, okay? So keep that in mind. And I'm sure a lot of people would like to argue uh, the contrary points, <laughs> okay? So uh, I know I'm in the minority here. Okay, so here are the uh, folks that um, got nobles for inventing things, okay? And um, I covered some of these in the past, but I'll just get, run through them relatively quickly. You've got uh, Albert Michelson for his optical precision instruments, uh, specifically the interferometer, okay? You have uh, Gabriel Lippmann uh, a year later. Again, these are the first 20 years of the Nobel Prize. Uh, they gave at least five uh, for five nobles for inventions, okay? And I want you to look at the type of inventions that these people got the nobles for, okay? And Lippmann discovered a method, a method, okay, for color photography. And so he, uh, he did some fa fancy stuff with color photography, and because he had this new method, he got a nobel for that. Uh, does that have anything to do with physics or science? Uh, is that just technology? Keep that, that's the question we're going to get down to as well. Uh, Marconi, well known for working on telegraphy, he had a big fight with Tesla, they went to court. Uh, Marconi won, then the United States government, uh, 20 years later, 30, 25 or whatever, in the 30s I think it was, then they uh, <laughs> went against Marconi because he wanted money for stuff that he didn't do, or at least the government claimed that he didn't do, and so uh, they had a big fight over patents. Um, I covered this uh, other fellow, Dalen, okay. Um, he, he invented an automatic regulator for use in conjunction with gas accumulators for illuminating lighthouses and buoys. And the question is whether that deserves a Nobel. And again, I just want to mention that he was Swedish, same place where the nobles come from, uh, who grants them, okay? And in 1912, in fact, he went blind because he did a lot of experiments. One of them blew up in his face, just went blind, uh, blinded him. And so, yeah, uh, the question is whether there were more important inventions than uh, this one. I mean, <clears throat> I mentioned, um, on the one hand, uh, the Wright brothers, they invented the airplane. 1903, nine years before, they had already a running airplane, which was certainly going to be used uh, two years later, 1914, during World War I. And it developed very, quite swiftly. And no one ever received a uh, Nobel for, for anything related to the airplanes. And so the question is whether an airplane is more important or had a greater impact on human life than, what, illuminating a lighthouse? <laughs> so yeah, a lot of these prizes I think are political and there I think you see uh, proof, evidence, okay? 1920, the last one in the first 20 years, succeeded in finding an alloy of nickel, okay, and steel, right? That registered almost no change in length and volume as a result of temperature changes. Okay, great. I mean, is that uh, such an important thing for humanity uh, to deserve a Nobel for that? But, and again, these, these are inventions in the question of whether uh, the Nobel should be given to science, uh, specifically physics, because it's called the Nobel of Physics, right? Nobel Prize of Physics. And does this fall under physics, inventing gadgets? Okay. And again, are there, were there more important inventions than the ones you just heard? I think the only one that really, to some degree, had uh, a big impact from those, uh, probably tele telegraph, right? But even that was changed over time, okay? Because I don't think anybody uses the telegraph per se today. They use, you know, other stuff that's been more advanced. Okay, uh, this is the second wave, and you can see the type of inventions changed. The, you'll, you'll see the something changed here, and that's uh, 20 years later, starting 20 years later after the last... Uh, one was given for uh, some kind of technology, some kind of gadget. <clears throat> First one was uh, Lawrence, and he invented the cyclotron, which is an accelerator, okay? Uh, it's a cylindrical type of um, accelerator, and the particle goes like in a spiral, okay? So he got it to go in a spiral with magnets, etc. And 
accelerated um, uh, down the beam line. So because of that, you know, they were able to use it uh, to study what particles. So he got a uh, Nobel for his cyclotron. Uh, next guy who gets one uh, for uh, technology and gadgets, okay, things, okay, for the invention of an apparatus to uh, produce extremely high pressures. Great. So, so we have high pressures, okay. Next one, uh, I covered him, Blackett, uh, for uh, improving, because uh, the Wilson chamber was invented by Wilson. That's why it's called the Wilson chamber, <laughs> okay. And so he, he improved on it, and because he improved on the Wilson chamber in such a way that uh, the mathematical physicists who work, you know, the particle mathematicians, they can accelerate particles over there. Well, this helped them a lot, and they said, uh, now we can see particle, we can see traces, and so on. The next guy, um, he improved uh, the technique um, in order to study radiation and nuclear reactions uh, because he says charged particles moving through photographic emulsions leave tracks that can be examined in the images developed afterward. Okay, so, so now you can see uh, the trace of a particle, if that's what they're seeing, a particle scraping through a gas, and this guy said, okay, we can take a, these uh, well, he, he showed that you can take a picture of that. Okay, so that was his contribution. Again, we're talking about particles, we're talking about electrons, we're talking about atoms, ions. Okay, that's, that's where they headed. You can see there's a little difference between the first 20 years to uh, the uh, inventions that started 40 years after the novel started uh, being handed out. Uh, Glazer, uh, invention of the bubble chamber, which replaced the Wilson chamber. Okay? I uh, put this uh, gas in there and uh, was able to look at the traces through the gas. And in 92, Charpa, for his invention and development of particle detectors. Same thing as the others, but in particular, the multi-wire proportional chamber. Okay? So they, came, they, they replaced a lot of this with wires, and eventually was replaced by semiconductors. Okay? So, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the chambers in which they study particles, or so they think they're studying particles, those have been modified over the years. That's what these guys got Nobles for. Okay. okay um, Next set of people, uh, they're, they're interspersed in between, okay? but they worked on microscopes and telescopes. They improved on different types of devices to be able to peer into the world of the small. Okay? And so the first guy uh, for his invention of the phase contrast microscope. Second guy, um, telescope designed to capture radio waves. And the third guy um, for his fundamental work in electron optics and for the design of the first electron microscope. Okay. It's called a SAM scanning electron microscope. I use those. I was certified on use of uh, electron microscope. Then they came up with this other one uh, about the same time. I guess the scanning uh, tunneling microscope. Never used one of those, but uh, same thing. It's to peer into the world of the small. Can they take pictures or images or whatever of, um, of an atom? Uh, yeah, like through a telescope. Okay. I mean, I, I use these things. I, I could see very deep. I, could, I never saw individual atoms. Uh, or even arrays, because I worked at a, a level that didn't require that sort of detail. All I needed to do was identify what uh, a particle, for example, uh, had fallen on my wafer, and you have this, uh, this graph that tells you what the chemical elements of that particle are. Okay? And uh, for that, you use a SEM to see it first, to locate it, then you find out what it's made out of, and then based on that, you take decisions on what to do. Maybe you got to clean the chamber, maybe you got to... Um, um, uh, clean the pumps that are maybe backstreaming into the chamber, etc. There's there's different procedures to fix problems in the fab, okay, fabrication area. And so yeah, um, uh, microscopes help a lot for that. The question is whether that's science. I mean, what are we explaining with this? If that's what science is, if it's technology, well, does technology equal science? Okay, so this is the issue. I mean, you can invent a microscope, great. I mean, or telescope for that matter. Is that science? That's just a tool to help you work in the shop, in, in the manufacturing area, so to speak, uh, maybe in the lab, okay, if you're a, a researcher. That's got nothing to do with explaining a phenomenon. Okay? And so there, these are two different branches, and the question is, do both belong to science? And you've got to define science, the word science, in such a way as to encapsulate both of them. Okay? You've got to incorporate the two notions somehow in your definition of science. And this is where the problem is, because if you do that, then you're going to include the word technology within science as well. Okay? Because clearly, invention of a microscope, a telescope, or a cyclotron, or, or a telegraph, all those belong to technology. Is technology a branch of science? 
Is it part of science? Is science a branch of technology? This is where we draw the line, and it's important to draw the line, make it black and white instead of gray, because otherwise people start talking in circles. You're talking about science, and they're talking about technology, or vice versa. And, you know, again, people have this problem because there are no solid definitions. They have not defined them crisply, rigorously, black and white sort of thing. It's all gray. This is the problem, okay? Okay, um, next group of people. Again, uh, these are not um, uh, chronological. Exactly. I mean, they're, they're interspersed. I just pulled them out because they have a similar topic. Okay, that's why I pull these out. <clears throat> okay, and so here's um, uh, these fellows, and what do they develop or what they invent? Well, uh, John Bardeen, uh, Shockley, and Bretain, uh, they're known for developing the transistor. In the 1940s, I think, right after the war, they developed it. By 1956, they got a Nobel. And... Um, and I think the first, yeah, the first one was a bipolar. There's two kinds, two general kind, bipolar and uh, MOS, a metal oxide semiconductor. And I think they developed a bipolar. Okay? Uh, Kilby, for his part, in the invention of the integrated circuit. Okay? Integrated circuit is many transistors, as well as other things in there. Okay? So, so it's an um, a, uh, array of um, transistors with diodes and uh, capacitors and resistors, etc., all made chemically, okay? That's what a semiconductor is. That's what an integrated circuit is. And, of course, because of that, they were able to get rid of some of these bigger things, which we still use today. We haven't gotten rid of them completely, but they had these uh, printed circuit boards, which I worked on as well uh, earlier in my life. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you stuff these uh, printed circuit boards with transistors, capacitors, etc., and they're used uh, in different parts of the industry, of the electronics industry. Okay, uh, William Boyle and Smith, uh, what did they do? They invented an imaging semiconductor circuit, the CCD sensor. And again, that's uh, the one that's used today to detect particles coming from space or whatever. Okay. And the last one uh, was in 2014 for the invention of efficient blue light emitting diodes and diodes, uh, which has enabled bright and energy saving white light sources. So because we save on light, because they invented some new light uh, emitting diodes, um, LEDs, right? Um, you get an old for that? Just inventing a, a little device? You know, you would think that uh, we're straying from the purpose, uh, purposes of science. And again, is science technology is technology science. Is technology, is science about inventing gadgets? That's the question. Right? Okay, the last group of people here. Uh, that I'm going to cover today, and uh, it's these folks, and they invented uh, just a few things that are not specifically related to any of the other people. Um, and the first one is, if electrons are elevated to higher energy levels with the help of heat and light, okay, so you shine light or heat, uh, photoelectric effect sort of thing, okay, an avalanche-like effect occurs when they fail, fall to lower levels. And these fellows contributed to putting this phenomenon into practical use in masers and lasers. So they worked on lasers, okay? The next guy, uh, he worked on the hologram. And the last guy there, uh, he got his a uh, couple years ago. And what, he, what did he invent? Optical tweezers, okay? That's what he did. And what did they do? They grabbed particles, atoms, molecules, and living cells with their laser beam fingers, okay? And the tweezers use laser light to push small particles towards the center of the beam and to hold them there, okay? So they were able to manipulate with, this, uh, with these tweezers. They were able to manipulate molecules and atoms, or so they claim, okay? And yeah, it's, it's possible, but uh, the question is, um, those are tools. It's like saying I invented a hammer or a screwdriver. You need a noble for that? I mean, maybe in the days of the Neanderthals you would. That would have been you know, quite, a, quite an invention in those days. And okay, so these guys are able to push, let's assume, atoms around, okay? So you move them around. We still don't know what an atom is, what it looks like. Is it an atom an orbiting bead? Uh, you know, uh, electron that goes around the nucleus? Is that what an atom looks like? They don't have, they don't have a model for the most fundamental of atoms. <laughs> and, uh, and here they're giving nobles for a guy who says, oh, I can push those atoms around. Well, maybe you can't. What is it that you're pushing around? Can you draw it for me? And no, what he's pushing around is a little ball. And you say, if he's pushing a little ball, how can that possibly be if the atom, the quantum atom, is not a ball? It's an orbiting bead. And what he's pushing against 
if quantum has its way, are orbitals. What's an orbital? Many orbits. <laughs> That's why they called it an orbital. It's where you can find the electron bead somewhere within a certain volume. What's that volume made of? Energy levels? Is that what it is? Is that what the guy's pushing with his tweezers? Energy levels? Orbitals? Some abstraction? So again, we don't have an atom, but these guys are getting nobles for it, saying, I pushed the atom around. And again, we, we have a lot of technology and no science. Okay? So we have to define what science is and what, uh, what, a, uh, what technology, distinguish it from technology or from inventing gadgets. Okay, and so here's science. We define it, rational explanations. Physics deals with causes and mechanisms. That's what you have to explain. And in order to do so, you need to do it with objects. Here in this side, we don't do much philosophy, except next week when my, uh, next, next time around when my son comes uh, in, we're going to have another end of the month uh, review and debate, okay? So bring your questions, it's going to be real time. And then uh, to contrast this, we have technology, okay? And here you have a definition of technology, inventing, developing a gadget through trial and error, okay? That's what it's about. And it's synthesized by Mr. Edison himself. I have not failed. I found 10,000 ways that don't work. And uh, Tesla, <laughs> had a, who worked for uh, Edison one time, he, he had a good way of putting Mr. Edison in, in the right light. He said, if he, Edison, had a needle to find in a haystack, he would not stop to reason where it was most likely to be, but would proceed at once with the feverish diligence of a bee to examine straw after straw until he found the object of his search. Just a little theory and calculation would have saved him 90% of his labor. Okay. Yeah, I, I, in other words, um, Mr. Edison, apparently, if this is correct, and, I, and from his own words, you have to say that Tesla was correct, that that's how Edison worked. Um, he was not an inventor. He was a guy who bumped into walls. And the way he had the time and money to do so, so he put his people to work on bumping into walls until he found the right wall. That's how he, that's how he figured this out. So it's not like he was a genius in, in a sense that he thought and, and, and understood electricity and said, okay, I'm going to use this filament because I think it's a better material. No, he just tried one thing after another until he finally hit it. He says, oh, finally, I got the filament I need. And we don't use that filament today anyways. <laughs> but that was the best they had at the time. And uh, so he was able to sell it to thousands, maybe millions of people. And that's how he made his money. But that's different than saying, you know, he sat down and he really figured it out. He didn't figure out anything. In fact, when he died, both him and Tesla... Neither one knew what electricity is. And Tesla is, is famous for saying, you know, towards the end of his life, that someday someone will discover what electricity is. Meaning he had no clue. 